hello everyone welcome back to costume co hey today i have a great interview that we're doing and i have two people on this interview i'm delighted to have i have desira pasta I'm making sure i'm getting everyone's names right i have katarina windamuth <laughs> hopefully i got both of those right mm -hmm. and uh so anyways desira is the costume designer for a new movie called sing sing and katarina is your assistant costume designer did i get that correct yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to have a lovely chat about this new movie that's out in the theaters. But before we do, I was hoping maybe both of you could just do a little introduction about yourself. Um, so Desiree, do you want to start with yourself and you can just say a little hello? Yeah, sure. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, very excited to be here with Katarina. We could talk about it. Um, yeah, I'm a costume designer. I live in New York City. Um, and I don't know, I like all kinds of genres of films and I love um, leaning into that when I'm designing. And uh, I have a cat named Pluto and that's about it. Awesome. I, we're, I'm a cat person. I'm a cat, I have a cat as well. So we're, we're you know, cat people are good people. Uh, what are you, about you, Katarina? What do you have, would you like to say a little hello and a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Katarina. I live down the hall from Desira in Brooklyn. So that's really convenient when we work together. Um, and I also have two cats <laughs> uh, and I, I just love costumes a lot. I, I've always really enjoyed clothing as a way of communicating and um, it's just the perfect dream career. So I'm really happy to be here and talk about it. So well, before we get into Sing Sing, why don't you both tell me a little bit how you both got into costume design? Like Katarina, you can tell me a little bit about your, your journey and then Desiree, Desir, we can get to your journey. Um, why don't you tell us first, Katarina? Sure. Um, so I um, I grew up in Germany. Um, my, my father's German and my mother's American. So I growing up, the big event was Sundays. We would go to the American movie theater and watch an American movie. And that was my exposure to what was going on in the U S. Um, and I was just mesmerized by everything, you know, American, there's like a lot of hype in, in, you know, in my high school about it and people would like collect red solo cups and stuff. Like it was, it was very just like us trying to figure out, we thought like the breakfast club was what was going on here. Um, and I, the first movie I watched that really made me want to do costumes is, um, a single man directed by Tom Ford costumes by Ariane Phillips. I just realized at that moment that costumes were just so important. And I felt the presence of the designer and it was just such a stylish movie that I knew I had to get closer to whatever that magic was. And then, uh, went to undergrad and, and worked in the costume shop, uh, in the U S. Uh, and then I met Desira at Tisch and, um, the rest is just you know, our history, our, our experience working together has been really awesome and we're constantly learning. Um, and it's just a really fun experience. And I think it's just a great way to combine my love of clothes and also my love of just reading and research. So it's just, yeah, it, it, it allows me to work on a lot of different skills um, that I've been enjoying honing over the past years. And it's so great working with friends too, isn't it? It just makes like the job, especially when you're working those really long, long days to be able to hang out with your friends. So Desiree, tell us about you, about your costume journey. Yeah, I mean, it was a long, strange trip. Um, I started in architecture. I really wanted to be an architect, um, although I was always enamored with fashion as a kid and um, construction. I started sewing as a young person. Um, and then I went to college for architecture, did it for a year and a half, didn't work out, and then leaned more into my creative brain and I got a degree in painting. Um, Right after that, Etsy had just started. I started selling clothing that I was making um, and then happened upon the the like a small indie fashion line that I started. And I, I just didn't feel like I was telling stories, which is what I wanted to do. Um, ultimately, through another meandering on that long, strange trip, I happened upon um, Boardwalk Empire, where I worked for a few years um, behind the scenes and um, just became enraptured. Like I always was in love with film and television and production, but I, I never understood like the intricacies of it. And through that experience um, uh, and like through the intensive research of that show and some other shows I've worked on, um, I knew what I wanted to do. And that was combine both clothing and storytelling and character work and construction and research. And I'm also a giant nerd like Katarina, we love research. so. Um, it was the perfect melding of interests and then um, went to Tisch for costume design. Um, and the rest is okay. history, I think. 
Oh, sorry. For those, including myself, who don't know, what is Tish? Tish is the um, the department or the the school at New York University that has a, a bunch of different um, genres of creative creative work or creative uh, degrees, and we went to the Design for Stage and Film pr uh, program, which is a very tiny, tiny, tiny program at Tisch in New York City. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so um, now let's talk a bit, a bit about Sing Sing. Now, maybe I should get both of you just to explain a little bit about it, because it's better probably than me doing it. So do you want to just tell us about the, you know, the impetus of Sing Sing? Like, how did this movie come about? Like, and what and t maybe tell us a little bit about it as well is that too much pressure <laughs> okay uh, Desiree, do you want to start yeah i'd love to start the ball rolling and let katarina finish um sure. yeah this was a project that uh became uh a passion project for the director greg quidar and the writer clint bentley their co-writers they were they happened upon sing sing uh the prison and uh there was an arts program that they became involved with and started teaching classes at, and that is Rehabilitation Through the Arts, which was founded over 20 years ago at Sing Sing Prison. Um, and through their work there, they started writing a script, met some real men who were incarcerated, and then, um, I don't know if Katarina wants to keep going with that. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that the origin of it was just their really personal experience with individual you know, alums of the RTA program and also people who were in the RTA program they were working with, um, they were volunteering. And I think they were just really touched by what they were seeing and people um, experiencing theater in this unusual, really trying environment um, and finding joy and finding a sense of freedom through the power of their own mind and their own willingness to really just throw themselves into this program. Um, and I think that was just a really powerful experience um, and inspired this idea to make a movie that um, was, you know, it's a narrative film, but it draws on so many real um, interactions and so many real stories that they were told. Um, and that's something I also really admire about the script is that it's so, it draws so much on the accounts of people who were at Sing Sing and people who were at, you know, participating in RTA and whose lives were changed by RTA. Yeah. Now, one thing I didn't include in my questions to you, and I this is an observation I made with, and my husband was watching it with me, that uh, it doesn't feel like uh, it, we can't really tell what the time is. Like we don't really see cell phones, and there's really no indication. Like there's no title card or anything that says it was that purposeful to kind of keep it as a timeless um, sort of snapshot. Yeah. I mean, when you're inside, and I can't speak. Uh, to being inside, but from my understanding and through our, you know, our friendships we forged with a lot of people who were inside, um, time passes, but you don't feel it necessarily. Um, so not only is this a period piece and that we were honoring, um, 2005 is when Breaking the Mummy's Code was put on um, at Sing Sing, which was chronicled in this film. Um, we just wanted to say that this is a story that's been happening since you know since people were, have been incarcerated and these are like this is the this is the um this is just a story that can happen throughout time and it just so happens to um take place in 2005 and um the relationship between those outside and those inside was extremely important to us and the filmmakers um to tell accurately and you know you don't have cell phones you don't have um magazines and you don't have uh news or you know i mean obviously you have those things but like it's secondhand you're not mm -hmm. like in the world experiencing it so we wanted to i mean like time kind of just stops when you're living day to day yeah that's a that's a very good point um and then so and then the characters like most the majority of the characters are wearing some form of the green uniform which is is that what they actually would have worn it at sing sing at some time that particular green? Um, well, so we, yeah, I mean, this is the color that Sing Sing um, had at that time. We did intensive research um, through both documentaries and then also the Department of Corrections. Um, and I will say that these aren't exactly the same because um, prison garb is, is very insular and like it's created for the prison. And so we as filmmakers weren't able to access that. Like we tried very hard, we wanted to. 
Um, but ultimately with the parameters parameters of our budget and also just um, our time frame, we had to um, purchase workware that we got new and then aged, but like it's extremely close. But one thing is we wouldn't, they wouldn't have um, the same closures in the pants that we had in our pants because um, it's more elasticated. It's not um, like, it's not like a zipper and button situation, which is what we had, but. Sure. Cause I guess it's supposed to be, you know, like you, it's like small, medium, large or something that you can, you know, they can just assign. They don't have to worry about like waist size or inseam or that kind of thing. Like you would have with workwear. Yeah. And I think also just um, in terms of limiting abilities to have anything to work with that might compromise another person's life. Um, sure. So it might be dangerous to have a zipper in a, in a pair of pants or something. Or, is that what you mean? Or just, yeah, just having had a, like, I, I guess like for even for um, affordability, you know, like limiting, but I, I, Katarina, do you have anything to say that I'm missing? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I think that the prison wear is really regulated and um, it's also, I think, kept under wraps because I think a lot of it is still made by prison labor. And I think it would be really problematic for people to be able to buy that for profit, although it's already problematic that a lot of prison labor is used for making the prison uniforms um, at, you know, just, yeah. So I think that there's just a lot going on there, even like within the very clothing that people are wearing that speaks to um, people being exploited um, for their work. And it was interesting to try to get at that from a different angle. And people did say that they felt very authentic and that it was eerie to put them on. So I think that there was some quality to that specific color of green and the specific weathering and wearing that we did um, that made them feel pretty close to the what the real thing. Um, but yeah, I think it was a really interesting learning experience to see like what aspects of the clothing were designed to prevent people from being um, harmed or from people uh, using any elements of the of the uniform as as a way to uh, hurt other people. But um, yeah, they're very standardized. They're very um, ill-fitting. Um, and we kind of got into that as well with some of the people who were in the movie saying that they would get things tailored to make them feel more like themselves, like clothing that they would wear. Um, and that was that customization was really important, I think, to a sense of self-expression um, at Sing Sing and other prisons. So, so that brings me actually, that's a really good point. Cause I know that, so each individual character you sort of customize, like, even though kind of reminded me, or maybe this is a terrible example, but when I was in high school, I, we had a school uniform and everyone sort of like customized their school uniform, you know, like uh, sometimes it was against the rules. You would show up and they go, no, go home. You can't wear that, but that would happen. So each um, inmate, I, that's probably not the correct term, incarcerated person, Mm -hmm. uh, would uh, would adjust their outfit to suit maybe their personality. So do you want to speak a bit to that? And also my other second question to that is, how much did you consult with the actor uh, on how their outfit would look on them in their fittings? So two questions, sorry. <laughs> I think uniforms are really incredible in that um, throughout the history of using them, they've either created a sense of sameness and uniformity in like a powerful sense, or a loss of identity. And that's something that we really wanted to explore in this film because it is extremely, um, I mean, it's, it's an integral part of the loss of individuality and the loss of autonomy in, in the world. You know what I mean? Like, regardless of whether or not you're in prison for something you've done, you're stripped of certain things. And one of the ways that we as humans express ourselves is through clothing. And one of the things that we as costume designers are, you know, constantly thinking about um is how does one express themselves through clothing so mm -hmm. um on like a on a level of of um psychology you know like i think people naturally want to figure out how they can like you know cuff a pant if it's whether it's comfort or whether it's style like how does one with the same things that other people around them have how does one express themselves. So that was something that we leaned into as costume designers and wanted very much to explore, but then through the process of interviewing and, and asking questions of the actors and those who had been inside, um, we got like firsthand information that we never could have imagined um, and never could have actually like gleaned ourselves without having asked those who had been there. 
Yeah, actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to put it. I have a few pictures of just um, some of the uh, it's now on, on camera. It kind of looks like a blue green like but um, it, is that um, is that sort of the color that it is? So sort of a, like more to the teal blue. Um, or, or is it a true green? Do you think like that's more green green? I think it's so hard to talk about color. I don't know yeah. what Katarina thinks. I think, I mean, the description is, is forest green, but I think depending on what we use to break it down, the color changed a lot. And the sure. newer ones, crisper ones, seem have more of a kind of yellowish quality. And then when you really break it down, it, it does start looking a little blue. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that we really wanted to create as well, a, a spectrum of, of color to show that different people had been in prison for different periods of time. And there's only so much that you can get your clothing laundered. So it was worn and you didn't get, you know, a change of clothing all that often. So it, it really reflects in the clothes themselves, how long someone has been in the prison. Um, Interesting. So they wouldn't reissue new clothing. Like you, once you get your outfit, that's kind of it. I, I found I, a chart. Sorry. Yeah. No, you I found a chart on the department of corrections that spelled out how long each item is supposed to last for. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we tried to think about and use in our breakdown uh, situation um, is like, you know, if Cole, or excuse me, if Divine G is in the prison for 20 years and he's been given, therefore, four rounds of free issues, what does it look like? And like, what are different elements of status within the prison that somebody mm -hmm. who came in a long time ago has that a newer, a newer um, person hasn't gotten because they no longer issue it? But I didn't mean to cut you off, Katarina. No, that was great. Yeah, that's totally, yeah, Desiree did this really amazing research where she looked at what exactly they were issued, the items, and then how much that would affect the wear, depending on how long that person had been incarcerated. Um, and I just wanted to say, too, that people who were there, also a lot of the background actors were formerly incarcerated. So people were talking to us from background saying, you know, we wouldn't ever have worn these in our prison. People who had been incarcerated in you know southern states or in the midwest like had totally different experiences as to what was and wasn't allowed in prisons and they were just talking amongst themselves about what would and wouldn't be um allowed and there there are so few records of what goes on within prison walls that it was this fact-finding mission for us to figure out specifically sing sing 2004 what was that what did it look like um unfortunately we had people we could talk to about that but everyone's memories were slightly different. And it just goes to show that there is no standardization of what happens in prisons across the United States. And um, it was very interesting just to hear like how different states approach the prison wear, even like the shoes, soft toe shoes versus hard toe shoes, um, all that stuff kind of went into our research and we tried to get things as accurate as possible um, while still working within our, our budget and our means. Yeah, and then there's also those times when they're in their cell, and I was like, it doesn't appear that they are issued pajamas. They just looks like they just take off their clothes and they're wearing their singlet, like a white singlet, and maybe shorts. I think if I really yeah can explain that a bit, it's d dependent on again the prison, but like at Sing Sing proper, um, yeah, they had like a tanks and then some shorts. Um, it's also dependent on how much money you had, like or. Um, resources you had within so like you could potentially get a sweatshirt um or sweat oh, okay. sweatpants okay. um but it's yeah usually pretty slip simple they do have pjs as well but um we didn't have examples of that at our at our um prison well and it worked for the story because they kept talking about how hot it was in the cells and by the way i was going to mention this this is really really crazy so a few weeks ago uh in kingston uh where i uh, near where i live we had one of the largest penitentiaries in the country and it was closed it's decommissioned now but they do events and tours there so we went there and it was stifling on the inside like during the humidity and i can't even imagine what that would have been like and the cells of course are just ridiculously small as you had showed like how big are the cells like this is just just out of my own interest they look so tiny it's dependent on the block they're in okay but sorry what were you gonna say Oh, I was just saying it looks like you could fit about two twin beds side by side in the room. And one of them is a twin bed. So the other is just kind of a hallway that you can put things on the walls, but it's, it's very small. Mm -hmm. So, and there's, and you know, so uh, 
you can't open a window or anything, I think. So yeah, so you're, you were sort of keeping that in mind that, you know, they, you know, I think there was even during that one scene where the, the two mate, inmate or the two, sorry, incarcerated persons are having a chat. Um, he's complaining about how hot it is. He can't sleep that type of thing. So I will add that, um, like full disclosure and like, this is all the more reason to celebrate this movie. We actually worked in those conditions. The actors were acting in those conditions. So that two years ago we had a heat wave, it was a hundred degrees and we were shooting in upstate New York or upstate, but um, the Hudson Valley. Um, we were working in a decommissioned prison that had- Oh, you were, okay. Yes. Cause that's the same and with Kingston Penn, they do movies there. Yeah, so this that's is interesting. Downstate. And um, oh. I mean, like we were in on air conditioned, um, 100 degree buildings so this was like this was method for us like i think i'm you know it was it was hard like not even for crew but for the actors like there was no air um we we were constantly wiping perspiration and using hair dryers and um it was extremely hot and so that's another reason that we need to laud the actors who like through this circumstances mm -hmm. and through this trauma and through this reliving of trauma, we're working in unbearable and not nothing to say about the filmmakers. Like this is, this is what we had. And like, we had air conditioners brought in, but like, just, they don't do much in like, you know, hundreds of square feet. Yeah. Yeah. So you did, cause I was, I was going to ask you if you had to add sweat and everything, but it doesn't sound like you had to, it was our, like it was natural. Yeah. That was all authentic. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, like Sing Sing, I think, was built in 1825. So it was built before air conditioning, before rising temperatures, before all of that um, by uh, people who were going to be living there. So that's, um, I think that things, just those buildings are not built for air conditioning and um, it needs to really adapt to what's going on. Like, I think that it's it's it was really it's something to hear it you know but it's another thing to really feel it when you're on set um when you're there for 12 hours and you just understand that you know the the concrete is just absorbing the heat and radiating it for the rest of the day even after sundown and i cannot imagine sleeping there you know we got to go home to our hotels but oh my gosh yeah well yeah. my sister like when we went into that prison she actually had to leave she was having like a bit of a panic attack I mean, there were a lot of people in the tour too. So she just walked in. She's like, I have to get out of here. It, so I can't even imagine. Um, and I think it actually was a pretty profound moment for a lot of the people on the tour because That's awesome. they, had they had never seen that before. No, it was, it was really a way, uh, awakening. Um, and, and that actually brings me to something that's sort of interesting about what I've read. Some of the reviews on this is that it's a very different experience as a viewer to watch something like this. Cause whenever we hear about a prison movie, it is, you know, we have our sort of stereotypes of what a prison movie would be, right? So this sort of, what is it? Subverts your expectations, I suppose you could say. So we're, when you read the script, were you sort of surprised at, at, at that? Or was there anything about the, the script of the movie that sort of surprised you? Um. I mean, that's a great point. I, I, first and foremost, I had never known about the re, re, uh, rehabilitation through the arts program, mm -hmm. you know? So like first and foremost, that was mind blowing and awesome. But my sister is a psychotherapist who works with a lot of formerly incarcerated folks. And, um, you know, she's read books and, and had me, uh, also read books about like, uh, trauma drama or, um, uh, and the body keeps the score and like all of these books that are essential to understanding how trauma affects us. So I think, um, obviously the script brought the humanity and the personal stories, um, out. And, um, I mean, I, also just like the fact that John Whitfield is innocent and still incarcerated and, um, clemency hearings just didn't work. So, um, I think like it sucks to hear these stories of individual, um, plight, but also, um, I think it was just refreshing finally to see a story depicting, um, and not glamorizing and not, um, cheapening the reality of, of incarceration. Mm -hmm. Um, Desira, while we're, you're speaking of that, I was going to ask you, so you were talking about your sister. So you actually consulted her as you mentioned, and, but did you, you also, I think you brought her in during fittings to help you. Is that um, correct? Oh, 
it, that's not correct. No. Oh, um, sorry. Okay. So explain then how she, how you, you ended up working with her then on this. Is it just, she helped you with the research? So, um, I have a very close relationship with my sister and I'm very grateful to her and she's an incredible human who does amazing work. And, um, so she's again, a psychotherapist who deals with those who have substance use, um, disorder. And then also who've been incarcerated and who are, or just have experienced trauma. So she's like a trauma specialist. Um, and that's something that, uh, Katarina and I going into this program or excuse me, to this project knew, um, we would be working with people who had been, actually um in these circumstances and and reactivating their trauma um and so it's just something that we felt was important to educate ourselves on prior and then also go in with extremely sensitive you know hands and eyes and ears um as we like what is the difference between being out and in and like one of the biggest things is clothing and so we knew that we had to prepare ourselves for um, something that was far different than an actor throwing on something and playing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Sorry, uh, Katarina, did you want to add something? Oh, I just wanted to say that it's just a huge, it was a huge ask, you know, to ask these actors to trust us um, and to give us, you know, their personal clothes in exchange for the greens that they had to wear um, for, for years. Um, and it took some time to, to build that trust. And, and I think that we um, just have like a huge amount of respect for the guys who agreed to go back and, and relive the worst time of their life to share their story with the world. I think that takes a huge amount of courage. Um, and the clothing became such a, a vehicle for that transformation, for that sort of time travel back to, to that period in their lives that um, I think I, I just can't overstate like how brave it was to to do that in front of so many people um and it was yeah it was just this is a great group of people i'm really yeah. how many extras did you have as well i know you had your core cast but then how many other we had over 30 have? right mm -hmm. i think like that at the most there were about 50 people there uh mm -hmm. and we we just had like a you know a, a, a People, we just like handed out clothes based on people's sizes, but we didn't totally know what people's sizes were going to be. So it was a little chaotic. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of people. Now, um, um, oh, sorry, Desiree, do you want to go ahead? Oh, no, and I was going to say, uh, I just wanted to add because it, that made me recall the heat. Uh, we did a lot of laundry, but go ahead. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, every night, probably before the next day. And um, day. So and a, oh, and a, okay. So Coleman Domingo, he's like the big star in this, right? Well, for actually, I have two questions about him. One, what was the decision about his glasses? Like, was there some conversation about his glasses? Because that felt like a very important um, uh, costume piece that he wore. Uh, it's also like a prop. He uses it quite a bit. He takes them off. He cleans them, that type of thing. Did, was there some discussion around that? Yeah. So um, I will add that uh, John Whitfield, um, so we were talking about research and, and um uh, making sure that we were honoring the people that we were depicting. Uh, John Whitfield, who Coleman Domingo plays, uh, we got incredible uh, personal photographs that he entrusted us with. Um, that was a that was a you know a great um, a great just scrapbook of like his time. So he had a lot of photos, and so those glasses he has glasses. He wears glasses. Those were very similar to his own. And so we, you know, wanted to give Coleman as much to work with as we could. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, those glasses we tried, we sent, we had, it was during COVID. So we had to send a whole bunch of different pairs to Coleman's house and he would try them on and take a picture and send us. And then we got like the frames or the lenses swapped out for movie lenses and yeah. Yeah. And because they actually, I think they're different. They look, I, I could be wrong, but they look like they were different at the end of the movie when he's released. Is that correct? Yeah, they're, they're more just silvery. Slightly different. Yeah, yeah we just slightly different. Because you know, to show some time had passed, right? Glad you noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, cool. when you aged, he looked aged as well. I think. Yeah. I believe. I'm not. Now and then, I know you were talking about like you know he's a little bit more. He's an he's a man who's innocent. And not that buttoning up your shirt means you're innocent, but you did some things to his costume to kind of reveal that he is a man who's being incarcerated um even though he's innocent did you want to talk a little bit about his look 
Um, yeah, I mean, how does one, if someone's going to court, how do they dress? You know, like you might be with your lawyer and you're in a t-shirt and jeans. And then when you go to court, you usually put on a button down shirt and a tie. So what's the equivalent of that when you have prison greens? And so that was a conversation we had with Coleman, you know, like how, how can we make him feel like he is taking this as seriously as possible? And you, you, you wear your long sleeve button down and you put it all the way, like, I mean, that's as, as like, as minimal and as max maximal is that a word um mm -hmm. as you can as you can do within those confines mm -hmm. but then also now i was curious about the purple hoodie which i have a picture of here um so what was the choice to have him in in this outfit and like so would this be an example of like you said you could order prison wear or if you you know had enough money in your account what was that all about do you want to talk about that katarina Oh, sure. I mean, there were certain items of clothing that were um, regular street clothes that you could wear uh, in prison that had to adhere to certain rules, um, only solid colors, no blue. Um, and that particular purple hoodie was a purple hoodie that we in our research saw that Divine G actually was wearing a lot of the time. And it seems to just be his statement hoodie. Uh, it just became part of his, his character. Um, and this room where they do rehearsal is a, a room in which they can step outside of the prison and be um, themselves and share themselves with each other and be vulnerable. So I think having them in clothing that wasn't strictly the prison greens in this space was important to visualize, you know, to signify that this is a place where they can be a little bit more themselves. There are still a ton of rules that they had to follow to wear um, just regular street clothes um, in prison, but it did add to just a sense of, you know, personality that they couldn't have elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It looks good on him too. It's a nice <laughs> color on him. But uh, now I guess no blue because of the guards are in blue. Is that correct? Yeah, the corrections officers, um, there's a very strict color coding system in mm -hmm. prison and uh, blue signifies corrections. And so even visitors cannot wear blue. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, and you actually, we didn't even touch on that. So I, I think there were, I, I remember at least one um, corrections officer. Uh, so you had to do those uniforms and do research on those as well, I guess. Oh, yeah. Um, we yeah. had, I think, six or seven um, mm -hmm. throughout the film, men and, men and women. And a couple of them had been our real corrections officers. Real quick quip. quip um, uh, Derek, who played one of our corrections officers in the film, is really one. And he, when we were at the Toronto International Film Festival, we were all out, Derek had come, and he said to Divine G, John Whitfield, that his um, experience of dealing with those who were incarcerated was forever changed by this movie because he viewed people, like, he, you know, he has a very, like, uh, black and white relationship to, um, to those he's managing within a prison. So, you know, like, I think he experienced, I don't know if, like, I can't speak to the front that you put up, you must put up as a corrections officer, but he said that his mind was forever changed by the experience he had working on that film. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks to not only the audience, you know, grappling with the humanity that's present in this movie, but also those who live it day to day were forever changed by this unique story. Now, regarding like Katarina, I know that you, it says that you had to go um, through the SUNY, is it SUNY, S-U-N-Y? Yeah. Per, uh, uh, purchase college storage facility. It was like yeah. 2,000 square feet or something. Desra and I went um, with Brent Buell, who yeah. did write the the original Breaking the Movies Code. Um, and Brent was showing us around and it was really wonderful, but it was also just a treasure hunt. And we spent so much time in like costume rental spots uh, over the years. And um, it was really fun just seeing and kind of reenacting, I guess, what volunteers of RTA must have done in you know early 2000s to put the costumes together for, for the plays. But fortunately, we happened on a few pieces that were in the original um, production. So we incorporated those and then just built on that does already want to talk a bit about it? Yeah, it was cool because uh, I, I think one of the questions that we've gotten a couple of times um, in talking about this project is like, oh, you know, you went to the costume shop and then you grabbed the costumes from the original production in 2005. It was a very different experience. We um, 
we come from New York City where like the costume shop is the size of a bedroom. And then we go to this incredible sp space upstate and they're like, yeah, they're here somewhere. And like, we literally have, you'll see like our spelunkering um, headlamps oh, on. I have a picture of you here. Yeah, here you are here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we're just scouring this incredible space with incredible stuff um, with Brent for, you know, hours. And we happened upon stuff that I'm sure students had been, you know, able to access for the last 20 years. And, you know, we were able to find a few things that was just like stunningly awesome. Um, was treasure hunting for sure. And then, um, yeah, so the school graciously let us borrow a few things. Um, and then we went from there. Yeah, so my question is like in reality, where would they have gotten all of the material to to do the shows? Like would they have re upcycled things? Like would they have cobbled together things? I, I had mentioned to you, I noticed right away and when I was watching the movie that it looked like there was crossword puzzles that were used to make the headpieces, like they were paper mache and then painted. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about that? I've got some pictures of that too. We can talk about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we had the video of the original production. Um, so that was awesome. We, we, we honored it as best as we could and took the ingenious things out of it and, and sh let them shine. And then also tried to figure out how we can make certain things more cinematic. Um, the, uh, so the, a lot in common played by uh, Dino Johnson is like this huge gold helmet that was originally used in the production. And we found, like Brent found that in this costume shop and it was still intact. It's made out of, I'm pretty sure paper mache and like painted gold. And it like somehow survived 20 years of student torture. Um, and we- Is it this one? <laughs> uh, no, I made that. Oh, you made that one. Okay. I don't so, have a picture of it, um, I don't think. There's a, there's like a, actually, I think one of the sketches you've got, it's like a red um, tunic. Yep. This one? Yeah. Oh, so that yes, was, yes. that's the headpiece is based on the real thing that um, was used. And so mm -hmm. I just, I mean, I love headpieces in general and I think they're so fun. Um, and so uh, using that um, and then hopefully we'll find an image eventually of the, the real thing. We'll show you. Um, but I really wanted to make paper mache. Well, I'll just go back and say like we wanted to use materials that were realistic to the circumstances that they were working with and so they either had things donated they were uh again like loaned things from suny purchase costume shop which is a college up up there um very close to sing sing um also like you know um donors or rta um staff or um community members just like theater you know just like community theater it, it's very much uh you know reusing stuff that's in the in the garbage um using common household objects and seeing worth beyond what there really are and yeah that's what we really, really leaned into really hard yeah katarina do you have anything to add to that yeah desert and i went on like a scavenger hunt around uh, sunset park which is our neighborhood and um it was really fun to just kind of think about what objects could be something more like it was just fun to collect things and see this has potential you know this this sponge could become something these cookie cutters could be exciting um and that was just the our first kind of uh adventure getting into making those costumes together and um yeah we had a lot of fun doing it and i think once we met the cast it was also fun to see um how we could uh customize their costumes to really suit their character um because we learned so much about them throughout the shoot and we did a lot of the theater stuff i think towards the end right um so it was helpful to to know them better and to understand you know what they what they they needed in their scene um so it was cool to have those those materials with us in tow we also looked at shakespeare behind bars which is another um rta like company that's down south and they had made togas out of towels, just basic bath towels. And I thought that was so brilliant. So we used that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think I like that. there's so much magic in theater. Yeah, no, I was gonna ask you, so for the, like in real life, like, uh, because obviously they're building these sets and costumes and props, like who would have been doing it? Would it have been the cast who would, everyone would take a part, like do a section or did they have actual people? Cause I noticed at one point they had a woman come in who is a cast member. And then I felt like there was a woman who was uh, the costume designer, but how, how did that actually work in, in the story? 
Uh, we didn't have a costume designer. I shouldn't say we we had a costume designer. They did not. Um, they, uh, I mean, it, it was based again on gifts. And so Brent Buell uh, would bring stuff in and um, they had a wood shop at, at Sing Sing. And so they were able to use that um, to create some things. And then, um, I mean, like it, it was based on like materials, like, you know, you can't use certain hand tools, you can't use certain glues or materials. And so um, it, it was like, yeah, a combination of both like donations. And then uh, they have, so RTA does have staff and then Catherine Hawkins, excuse me, Hawkins um, is the, she created the RTA program. So she's depicted in the film. Um, so, uh, I mean, it was just a combination of, of Brent and of the actors and alum and donations and uh volunteers okay yeah because i noticed like there's one scene where they're going up to a rack of clothes and they're trying different things on so they would sort of try to find their character i guess um through like going through the different donations and what what is on hand i guess and then if they think oh i need something else then they would maybe put it together i just was like i was just wondering how that whole process works because no normally in traditional theater you have designers who sort of give that cohesive feeling but because it did it did feel cohesive though at the same time so maybe it's just that they're all on the same page with each other i think so and i mean i i think i think that more than anything this film we wanted to to again showcase how creative and fun community theater is and so if you think about like the black box like you know, small town theater, like who, there's no costume designer, there's no, you know, lighting designer. It's really dependent on whatever they find in the, in the storage unit or in the costume storage, whatever they get at the Goodwill. And so like, that's what we leaned into more than anything. And sure. then obviously if it's cohesive, I hope it's because of our work. Um, and then also, you know, Ruta, the production designer and um, yeah, but like it, I think like they did an amazing job, like a lot of stuff, like there were pirate shirts, there were Hawaiian shirts, those are all Brent's and mm -hmm. we got to use those again. Like he kept them in a box for 20 years and we brought them out for the film. So like, I, I think if anything, we were just again, leaning into the fact that they created this cohesive um, creative environment. Mm -hmm. Now, before we let you go, I'm just, I have some pictures. Maybe we can just quickly go through them. A few of your designs. Sure, okay, thank so you. I'm just gonna pull some things up here. You can just maybe give us a few words about each of them. <laughs> um, another thing that I really wanted to do was um, up, like turn the greens upside down. And so I thought like as like a, a fist to the man, um, they could rip apart their prison greens and create costumes out of them. And so that's something that this is a, a tree costume for um, uh, one of the vignettes in uh, Breaking the Mummy's Code. Mm -hmm. So it's like in uh, Robin Hood's forest. And so we sewed a million different um, ripped apart prison uh, pants and, and shirts into tree costumes. I love that. Another, um, uh, what's it called? Robin Hood. Like, again, like, yeah. like how can we, how can we rip apart the prison greens and create something new or make it very subtly still like, you know, uh, like how can you turn something that is, uh, basic and but like that green button down shirt and how can you turn it into a costume yeah oh now would the these have been like decommissioned um greens like the the old the old ones so that because otherwise they would be like you can't do that you're not allowed to cut those up this is a cinematic liberty oh okay okay no i love it i love it i'm just wondering in real in real life okay we were talking briefly about this a lot in common that mm -hmm. is um in ancient rome is that right, Katerina? Well, originally he's in ancient Egypt, and then I think there's like a time travel, and does he end up in Rome? I don't know. It's it's a really wild script. But yeah. Now, did you guys actually? Protagonist. Did you guys read the the actual script? Like, there was a real script, yeah. right? Like, oh yeah. Read that. Yeah. So oh it yeah. Was bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not bonkers it's amazing it's prolific okay. brent buell <laughs> needs to be published um <laughs> we should start uh, it's putting like it on in a real million life pages in, long in the, yeah um now what's this i was really curious about this one well katarina made that costume but this is somebody who's been trapped um it's uh whiskerandos he's been trapped inside of a tower for hundreds of years and so the original played by dario pena 
had amazing, like just a big wig. And then we were like, how can we make this seem like he was really in there forever? And what materials can we use for this? So Katarina, what do we do? Oh, we got some brooms. We got a bike helmet. We got some yarn that we wove into the broom. Is it this? (laughs) Yeah. That's so awesome. And then it just kind of evolved or devolved from there. Um, (laughs) And there's a big old mustache somewhere that we made. I don't know. Um, but that's definitely the heaviest costume and the most mm-hmm. awesome, but fortunately, Jario was so kind about it. Um, so it looks like it's swallowing him up a bit. Like it's, it's, you know, he's, he's been, been engulfed by it. That, yeah. that is so heavy. And then on top of it, we found this incredible belted chain laden cape from Sunni purchase. That was like, yeah. I'm not kidding, like 75 pounds. And so wow. he had like this and we also distressed that mop wig so it was like just yeah he's a he's a trooper there's also fabric scraps in there i just realized oh yeah (laughs) is this is this this the wig here or is that's what you just saw it's the same one okay yeah so there he is standing okay oh what about uh no this is this is the rack right this is this is the rack uh no i don't know if this is the one in the movie or this is just the rack of clothes that you pulled that's that SUNY purchase. That's yeah. stuff we I recognize yeah. the one. I recognize the one there, though. Yeah, that's what Coleman movie. wears. Yeah, yeah. When he has his what, breakdown. What are, what are those uh, discs on there? Are they bottle caps? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of, yeah, just like household Very objects. Cool. I love it. And this is the two of you it was your uh, your lights on your head because it was it's always dark and gloomy in these spaces, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's at the costume shop. So there were mm-hmm. just these dark corridors that we uh needed to keep like we just like mined this place and so there were some parts we had to use our headlamps to actually see what was in there that's so funny now this i know this is uh you're starting to build the head pieces here which i was referring to you can see that they are crossword puzzles yeah i caught i got crossword puzzles at the dollar store and i awesome. cut them up and we got gallons and gallons of glue elmers and then Um, I had a great time. I just, we both love hand making things. And so there's a lot of handmade costumes and sewn costumes in this. And so that's just important to, to me and to Katerina. We just love making things from scratch. And so this was one of the many things we made. I love that. And you must have loved, you know, because a lot of time the designer doesn't get to get their hands dirty. Uh, Both of you, you have to delegate, but you got to actually get in there and do it, right? We were a team of two. So if it wasn't us, it was no one. It was, yeah. And then what about, and then there it is again. That's the one that Coleman eventually wears. So yeah, the, the one you just saw was actually the one that Clarence Macklin wore. That one is yeah. an, an Anubis. Yes. And then the next one is the snake that Coleman wears at the end of the movie when they're, um, when like you really see their relationship and they're on stage. So, so yeah, that. Here, this, but this is, um, so is this, is this this one here? Sorry. Is yeah, that that's one? Clarence Macklin's okay. Anubis that Katarina is. Kat, you, um, Katarina, you're wearing that, right? Mm-hmm. And you were masking during this time too, right? Was this during COVID? It was. Yeah. That's awful, eh? Yeah, that was extra hot. Be, it, was it was so steamy. So here's a pair of the, the greens that you're tailoring. These are for Clarence Macklin. And so uh, he had actually been incarcerated and he was very specific about, I mean, not but in an amazing way. Like he really like enlightened us with everything that he had asked for there. And then also made sure that we did. And this is his pants were tapered 31 inches uh, in seam in the front, 32 in the back. Um, that's what he wanted. And so uh, that was his, like his pants, uh, also evolved his his costumes also evolved throughout his time in this movie um just as his character did after he discovered rta and so um this is just one of the pairs of pants that we uh tailored for him based on his specs Mm -hmm. and then this is one of the costumes used i think this is from the beginning of the movie I made that from scratch yeah amazing it's a uh, that's what coleman wore yeah so that's what you make out of that is vinyl, um, okay. and then a lot of vintage studs that I've gotten, I got years ago that I still have a thousand of. And then there's fabric from from behind. We got that at the garment district, that like green that we wanted to have light pass through. Um, and then I aged, it's quilted despite, um, you can't quite see, but by uh, like the f- bodice of the doublet. And then um, it is painted and aged to um look old and then um 
yeah, we made those wings. And what was this crown made out of? That is made out of metal. And then I glued or super glued bolts and nuts and hardware because that's believably, you know, something you can find on the floor of the shop. Um, and then that was all sprayed, uh, excuse me, spray painted gold. Mm -hmm. And here's another one of his outfits. Yeah, that's wearing, one of the. He's it's wearing kind of like boxing gloves. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is um, so. This is like a pugnacious character. This is also a pretty pugnacious moment in the movie. Goliath. Yeah. So he's imprisoned and is trying to fight his way out of um, this indentured servitude that he's found himself in. He's so his line, I think, is like, I, I'll smash him, I'll bash him. Um, it's That's just so a very, very emotional scene. Um, and I think the costume really helped. Yeah. The, uh, it looks like his headpiece is so, almost like, you know, Roman ac acanthus leaves or something like that. You know, I can't remember if you had them green in the movie or did you spray it? Those are green in the movie. We literally got that at the dollar store and wrapped it around Coleman's head. And he was like, I love it. I hate it. I love it. So. Yeah, it's a hate love. Yeah, it's, it was perfect though. This yeah. is hilarious. I love this. So great. Thank you. Yeah, more, just more, what can you use? What is magical? Like what mm -hmm. does theater imbue with life um, and what are found materials? So yeah, these are just from cardboard that um, our, uh, in, not intern, but our production assistant, Grace, painted for us. Um, and then Big E is, just has suspenders wrapped around and that's a costume. Now, could he walk around in that? Like, or did he have to just sort of stand behind it? No, the, it's just like a, it's almost like a sandwich board. Like, um, <laughs> he just, he can, so the, he can the walk. The suspenders were holding it. We're holding yeah. it. And then he could kind of sh shuffle along. That's so funny. Uh, what's this? These are pins gifted to us from um, the superintendent of Sing Sing. Mm -hmm. um, so he did, or made a cameo in the movie. And we got a bunch of, of pins that um, were special to us for having. Wow, that's amazing. Here's some behind the scenes photos that you gave me. That's JJ Velasquez, our good friend, mm -hmm. who is innocent and was incarcerated for over 23 years for a crime he didn't commit. And wow. he's got an amazing podcast with Dan Slepian that everyone should uh, check out. It was nominated for a whole bunch of awards and he tells his story. Um, and he was a wonderful part of our, of our project. And then here's your uh, sort of a shot you got of everybody just relaxing in the shade because it was hot. It sure was. <laughs> uh, did you, um, uh, did you, were you, like you were saying you were at a hotel, like were you on location for most of the shoot? Like how did that all work? Katerina, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, we were on location for most of the shoot and we were all staying in the same hotel so we'd all have breakfast together and regroup after the shoot and talk about our days around the there was like a fire pit outside it was oh really oh my god fun. that's amazing i love that yeah it was really that, cool that reminds me of my first year doing summer stock i we all stayed at the same motel this little like this little sort of three-star motel in town just outside of town and then we would go in every day to the theater so that's really cool i love that yeah. um, um Shout out to the Red Line Diner across the street from where we stayed that we went to every single night. It's in yeah. Fishkill, New York. <laughs> you said it was upstate New York, right? It's in Fishkill. So it's the Hudson Valley. We Fishkill. call it okay. upstate in New York City, but it's not. Sure. That's so neat. Uh, here's just a, a shot. Now, this is sort of like this room I thought was really interesting. It was like an A-frame. Mm -hmm. That room, like it had that really cool ceiling with the ceiling fans and everything. But the the, the paint and everything was was peeling off the walls i think and there was brick under there is that what that was going on there that Those was the places, places yeah sorry go ahead sorry <laughs> i think that place was the old sanatorium right that we went to that we thought for sure would be the most haunted um of the locations uh but yeah it was a really beautiful place to to have the rehearsal space because it has that that a-frame shape um yeah does right yeah no i mean yeah like it it's like we have such short walls in this film and like you know, those cells are so are so um a, 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 like what's the word um oppressive and so like having that space to to play and to to act was really great um and um just production design wise like 
you know, opened the skies up. So, uh, but that, that place was very dilapidated and Katarina and I walked around with like a ghost meter and we were trying really hard because supposedly it's haunted. They have like haunted tours and we we're like, this place isn't haunted. Like we were asking for it. We were like, come and show yeah. us. Like they no. just didn't. No, that's interesting. No ghost Years ago, I worked in a theater that apparently was haunted and uh, I never saw, I never saw anything, but uh, I have had a couple of close encounters where I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye at my husband's mom's home. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, uh, I kind of, I'm a believer. Most, uh, by the way, they say that most Americans aren't, don't believe in ghosts, but the majority of British people do. Do you know that? No. <laughs> because, and I think it's just the buildings are so much older there. That's why. Yeah. Yeah, so, Downstate was haunted by a chipmunk that took up residence. Oh, wow. <laughs> we yeah. have a vicious white squirrel in Toronto that attacks people. I don't, it can't possibly be the same one over and over, but maybe white squirrels are just more aggressive than Whoa. brown squirrels. <laughs> Poor thing. Well, anyway, I, I, I can't keep you longer because uh, we're already a little bit over time, but I have to tell you, this was such a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed meeting both of you and learning about um, this experience you had. What a wonderful experience. And I really want to recommend everyone see Sing Sing. Such an amazing movie. I know come uh, Oscar time, there's been some buzz around it already. Super thrilled to hear that. And uh, it was a wonderful experience as a viewer going into it not knowing anything about this story and I really hope people learn more about it so before we go though can you both want to tell us what you're up to coming up like you have anything fun you're working on are you doing something together are you taking some time off um, okay Des. so I'm currently on a dark comedy in South Jersey that is a delight it's called damned if you do um and it stars some demons and it's very campy and I'm having Love a blast it. And the costumes are incredible. I cannot oh. wait to see it. It looks so good. I'm so excited. Oh, do you, you. are you able to say where it's going to be coming? Is it a, uh, a movie? It's a movie, yeah. So, oh, it uh, is. I mean, we're only halfway through production. So oh, I've... okay. Okay, and it's a dark comedy. I love dark comedies. But yeah, it's got... Stars... It's got... So Sorry? It, uh, it, it has a supernatural element to it, then, you said? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, like they're, they're, they're demons. Um, demons, yeah. but it's super funny. Um, and it stars Kate Siegel from, um, Oh, I love uh, her. She's amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wonderful. She's so cool. But yeah. Uh, so this, this has been my summer. Yeah. Oh, amazing. What about you, Katarina? Uh, I worked on a feature called until he's destroyed. I designed it like a couple years ago and it's coming out next spring. Um, directed by Josh Lobo. It's about, um, it's a, a kind of a sci-fi mystery that takes place in a quiet tech building at night and the security guard is uncovering a mystery of what's happening in this building. It's very broody. It's very, um, I think it's going to be really, a really stylish movie. Um, and then this fall I'm designing a movie called Recluse directed by Henry Chason, and that's a horror film about a dysfunctional family and a woman's relationship with her reclusive um, sculptor father in Vermont. And she uncovers mysteries about her own family and childhood um, while going up there and revisiting her childhood home. So those wow. are my two things. Wow, those both sound, oh, those projects all sound amazing. Now, are you guys on, are you on social media? Are you on Instagram or do you have your, do you have your own website or how can people find you? We both have websites, KatarinaWindemuth.com, DesiraPesta.com, although it might be .net, um, and then uh, it's .com. And then, yeah, we both have Instagram. Check us out. Okay. Keep in touch. I'll put, I'll put the links below. I, actually, Desiree, I know I follow you. I follow you on Instagram. Thank you. Katarina, Likewise. Katarina, I'll find you. Yes, thank you so much. All right, well, I want to thank you both so much. This has been such a blast. I really enjoy that you spent, you took your some time out of your day to chat with me and come on here and share with us this wonderful project. Thanks again. Thank you and have an awesome weekend. You as well. Okay, bye everyone. Bye. bye.